So in today's reading, St. Paul says something very, very interesting uh, about this, this thorn in the flesh. To stop me from getting too proud, I was given a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me and to stop me from getting too proud. About this I have pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me, but he has said, my grace is enough for you, my power is at its best in weakness. Okay, it's very difficult for us to see things from God's perspective because, not sure if you knew this, but we're not God. So because we're not God, it's very hard for us to see things as he sees them, okay? So we see things, we have a very, very limited perspective. We're limited by what we can understand. We're limited by our short lifespan. We're limited by the fact that we, intelligence-wise, we, we can't, it's going to be very difficult for us to grasp uh, everything that's going on, like from God's perspective, you know? So what is God's perspective? Well, ultimately, God's perspective is that all of creation, everything that exists and everything that he allows is to help us to get to heaven. Eternal life is what matters. Okay, so all these other things don't, they, they, they pass, they, they're not really important, which isn't to say that God is, is indifferent and we should be entirely stoic and just uh, indifferent to the world around us. That's, that's, that's not what we're saying at all. Uh, but just, it's just to keep in mind what the end game is, what, what the, the goal of everything is. The goal of everything is heaven. Okay, if, if, if we lose sight of that, uh, if, if we start to focus maybe on other things here on earth, that the goal of everything, for example, is happiness. The problem with this now, if you say for the goal of everything, the goal of our existence is happiness here on earth, now it's very, very difficult to make God look good. Because you'll say, well, if, if the goal of everything is good, well, then the goal, the goal of everything is happiness, then God is bad. Why? Because God allows storms and cancer and viruses and poverty and wars and pestilence. So if the goal of everything is happiness here on earth, then as I say, like the, the goodness of God starts to, starts to unravel. Because well, why would he allow all these things? Suffering in general, any, any bereavement that you've been through, God becomes the problem and the, the, the opposite. Well, he's blamed for being the opposite, the, the obstacle to my happiness. I would have been happy if this person or that person didn't get cancer. I would have been happy if I didn't have this physical ailment or this limitation. God gave all this to me. It's God's fault. That is typically diabolical, just so you know. That's really like straight out of, that's a thought straight out of hell. Um, to try and etch away at the goodness of God. God doesn't love you. God, isn't, God doesn't care. God isn't father. God is absent. God is distant, far away, powerful, but not interested in you. That's straight out of hell. That, that idea, like, it's, it's, it's horrific. Because, it, and also it's quite common. It's quite common for people to, to, to look at their lives, look at the bad things that have happened and say, where was God? He's not good. He doesn't care. So either he's not powerful, not powerful enough to help, or powerful, but doesn't care. Doesn't care enough to help. Either way, I want nothing to do with him. You know, it's just, so this, these, these are really dangerous, really, really dangerous thoughts. So, we have to kind of step back a second and go, hold on, what's, what, what is God's goal in this? What is God's plan in everything? Well, it's to get us to heaven, to get us to heaven. Now, if, if the perspective is eternal life, what if crosses along the way actually help me? Now, some of them, this is a, it's a difficult thought to, to explain briefly because some crosses it'll be obvious how they can help me. Other crosses will not be obvious how they help me. We believe that we will understand it from, from, from heaven's perspective, but here it can be difficult to understand. But let's look at a few examples. St. Paul talks about a thorn in the flesh to stop him getting proud, to stop him becoming proud. So say, for example... St. Paul didn't have this. Now, we don't know what it is. We don't need to presume it's, some, it's a sexual temptation. We don't know. It's, it's often presumed to be that, but he doesn't say, so we don't know. Uh, but imagine, like, if we had all the gifts that we wanted, okay? So you look amazing, and you're super smart, and you're super athletic, and your face doesn't sag at all, and your hair never changes color, and you've got perfectly, what are we supposed to have, tanned skin, Latin American skin, right? And everything looks fantastic. We look amazing. We have it all. Do you know, 
all the girls want to be with us, all the guys want to be us, whatever it may be, whatever, who cares? Those kind, that kind of idea, right? Okay, so you'd say, bless, you seem really blessed. Now, stand back a sec and see this from heaven's perspective. From heaven's, from the perspective of eternal life, does it matter that your eyebrows are perfect? Does it matter that you have the perfect weight proportional to your height? Does it matter that you've got really good fashion sense? Does it matter that you're average intelligence, super intelligence? Does it actually matter? Does any of that really matter at all? And in fact, if anything, what if these gifts start to get in the way? What if because I'm super attractive and of all these younger girls coming after me and my wife is kind of, ah, well, you know what I mean, bless her, she's great, like, but she's not exactly 20 anymore, you know? And, you know, so because now I'm super successful and famous and desirable, what if I start to kind of veer away from my, from fidelity in marriage? Well, then it's actually better. It would be better for my soul, for my family, and from the perspective of heaven, that I didn't have these good looks. It would be better that, yeah, I won't go into describing what a person should look like if they're average. Uh, it would be better that I wasn't super attractive. It would actually be a gift. It would actually be a blessing if, if all of these gifts actually start to lead me away from heaven, it's better I don't have them. Okay, so that's kind of not having something. What about having an actual cross? When, when an actual cross comes our way, a bad diagnosis, diagnosis of cancer, diagnosis of some sort of leukemia, uh, bereavement in the family, like proper difficult crosses. Um, you might know families like maybe who have a, a child who has Down syndrome or something. Great, great kids, but it, it's, a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, or a child with autism. Again, wonderful kids. It's just it's 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 a lot of work. You have to you have to you have to take care of them. You have to take care of them again, which is a great privilege. But at the same time, it's it's not straightforward. Like it's not. Uh, it requires an awful lot of giving from the perspective of the parents. I mean, you have to you have to. There was a program on there a while ago. Um, it was one of these renovation house renovation programs where they were getting a house ready for a couple that had twin boys who had a, a rare kind of a disease where the um, skull, the plates in the skull don't grow fast enough. They fuse together too early, I think it is. So then the brain doesn't have enough room to, to develop, so it starts to push everything out. So the eyes bulge, the, the sinuses kind of close up because there isn't enough room. The brain is after pushing down into the sinus. And um, so one of the kids has autism and severe learning difficulties and all sorts of problems. but because of this, like, the parents are on duty 24-7, literally, that the kids don't choke because their sinuses are all blocked up. So, and then feeding is, you know, it, it was heroic, absolutely heroic to watch these two parents, what they had to do. So the, the, the program there was about just uh, kind of extending their, their back lawn to make it all on the same level, uh, child-friendly, so that the, the kids wouldn't hurt themselves. But, like, the parents, they, 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 they described the story and... Uh, you know, with tears, they said, like, it's just, uh, how, old, how old were the kids? Uh, they were maybe eight, seven, eight, I think. And uh, they were just saying how it's, you know, look, I mean, we, we love them both, we love them dearly, but it's, uh, it's, you're con and even during the interview, you still see the, you still see them kind of, you know, check that they're all okay. You know, because they, they're just so used to checking constantly, the kids don't hurt themselves, or, or as I say, joke, or whatever, maybe. So they were just exhausted, absolutely exhausted. And you see how, how this this cross in their lives, right? I'm not sure if they're people of faith who didn't come up in the in, in the program, but what it did reveal in their hearts was a selfless, self-giving love that I'm not sure that those parents even knew that they were capable of. Okay, it kind of it, it kind of if you will broke open their hearts to love to the absolute nth degree. They they spent every day Loving, serving, cleaning, uh, doing everything that they needed so that their two boys would have life, would be fed, would be happy, would be protected. So this cross has now made that couple more like Christ than we could ever imagine. Christ on the cross, emptying his life for love of us. Now these parents emptying their lives for love of their kids. So that they're becoming transformed into love. They're becoming like God. If we're going to uh, take on his nature, be divinized in heaven, heaven, remember, we're sharing God's nature, 
then that cross has actually helped them get there. And these two kids, however long they live, we, we don't know, but their, the help of God will get to heaven and will, in their glorified bodies, will thank their parents for all eternity. So what looks like a family that has been forgotten by God is actually being prepared for heaven. See, this, this is not human logic. And from the enemy's perspective, he will point the finger at God and say, what did, you, what did they ever do to deserve this? From God's perspective, again, there's a difference between his permissive will and his perfect will. God doesn't want suffering. But he can turn this suffering into a good so that this, these, these four people, the two parents and, and, and the two children, actually there's, there's, a little, and there's another, there was another brother there as well, uh, that, they, they, uh, that they can all experience what it means to love, to love until it hurts. I remember meeting a couple of other families like where there was a, a family member uh, who has you know, Down syndrome or, or, or some sort of a, a difficulty like that. And you see in the family how, how it makes them so selfless because everyone else in the family, they, they have to take care of their little brother or sister. They have to make sure they're okay. They have to keep an eye on them. They have to, you know, if they're going out cycling, you have to, so it has to be someone there. So it makes, the, makes everyone kind of so selfless, not, not focused on self, but focused on, on the other, loving. So our, our, crosses, our crosses can be a blessing much more than we know. They can prevent us from sinning because at times, I mean, maybe for myself, if I was super at absolutely everything, maybe I'd just be just plain cocky. <laughs> Uh, which would be an awful characteristic of a priest. Uh, I can definitely be humbler. I definitely can. Something I always hesitate to pray for. Lord, make me more humble because you know how you become more humble? Through humiliations. And hands up, who likes humiliations? <laughs> but uh, I could definitely be humbler. But I think if, the, if, if, if I had had more of the, the, the gifts that I, I think I'd want, maybe I'd just become arrogant so it's better that the Lord leaves me leaves me as I am and I think then as as we show the Lord that we're capable of carrying these gifts without becoming arrogant then he can give us more and he can give us more as long as I show I'm capable of carrying what he has given me without it becoming a danger to my eternal salvation and then if God doesn't give it to me say for example I mentioned something before, you know, but I said I'd love to have a better memory to remember people's stories because, you know, I, I meet a lot of people and I'd love to be able to, to see someone I haven't seen in four years and remember everything that they told me about their family situation and, and their kids and sons and daughters and whatever, everything that's going on. Uh, I'd like to remember more. I'd love to remember more of Scripture. I'd love to be able to quote a chapter and verse much, much. I have to work hard to try and stuff these things into my, my very forgetful brain. Uh, but then, yeah... Two things. One, uh, if I was, if I did have a super memory, would I just become arrogant about it? And two, if I want that gift, am I willing to put in the effort now? So if you want these things, if you want to have a better memory for Scripture, what are you doing now to learn Scripture? And then if you show that you're willing to, you're, you're willing to use the, the, the limited gift you have now to remember these things, to do these things, then God can trust you with more. God can trust you with more. And then you're showing him and you're showing yourself that everything that you're, you've been given is for his greater glory, not for you. My grace is enough for you. And my power is at its best in weakness. It's not when we're super capable and super rich and super intelligent that then everything is fine and we're blessed. It's in fact when we recognize our need, when we recognize that we don't have it all together, when we recognize that before God or even before any of the problems that we might have to face, we're so small. And because of that, we need God's grace. If I live life like that, constantly saying, Lord, Lord, I need you. <clears throat> I don't have this together. I don't have everything I need, but I have you. And if I have you, I have enough. Because you are everything. You are everything I need. If this is my attitude, <clears throat> it doesn't matter that my face is sagging and my hair is grey, I'm not as strong or as intelligent or as whatever rich as I used to be. Those kind of things just don't matter at all. It just doesn't matter. I'm getting ready for heaven. 
And so then we can actually say, like, that's when I'm weak, that I'm strong. Because the weaker I am, the more I count on God, who is infinitely strong. So the weaker I am, the more I count on God, who is infinitely strong. And if I do that, then I lack nothing. I lack nothing. So let us not worry. Our gospel today was all about not worrying. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Ain't that the truth? So, we ask the good Lord to guide us today into this, this place of peace. A place where we recognize that our needs are actually a blessing. That our inability can actually draw us closer to the Lord. Just to finish with one thought, which was actually supposed to be the homily. Uh, St. Louis-Marie de Montfort writes about those who consecrate themselves to Our Lady. He says, They who are consecrated to her, she fills with her grace. She crowns with her merits. She enlightens with her light. She inflames with her love, and she grants them her virtue, her virtue, proportional to the measure in which the soul belongs to her. The more we belong to Our Lady, the more she grants us her grace, merits, her light, her love, the more we belong to her. So we ask Our Lady today to guide us to the heart of her Son and to open our eyes to recognize the blessing of the cross.